everyone and welcome to this session on uh, giving youth the tools to advocate for their own mental health and well-being. As Dana said, my name is Dr. Martha Staley. I am the director of the Childhood Trauma Learning Collaborative, which is the school mental health initiative of the New England Mental Health Technology Transfer Center. And we are so glad that you are here joining um, us for this session today. What we're presenting today was originally developed um, and delivered to a group of youth in Maine um, to talk with them um, about advocating for their own mental health and well being. We realize that some of you in the audience today uh, are youth, but many of you are concerned about youth or working within youth populations. So, um, Let's see, we can go to the agenda. So today um, we're going to start uh, with a mindfulness moment that Dana's gonna walk us through. We're gonna discuss what mental health means to you and or to youth, um, how COVID-19 has affected youth mental health, health, uh, understanding and addressing trauma and stress, advocating for mental well-being, and looking towards the future with optimism. Um, and we'll be also offering a couple of uh, techniques and exercises that you can use to help take care of your own uh, mental health and well-being. So um, I will hand it back over to Dana to walk us through our first mindful moment. Hi, so we would love to start today with getting ourselves into a mindful space. So if you could just take a brief moment to put down whatever you're doing to practice with us, um, go ahead and make sure your feet are firmly on the floor and you can take a deep breath in through your nose and let it out through your mouth and let your shoulders fall down. And then if you feel comfortable, you could place both of your hands on your heart and you're welcome to keep your eyes open or close them down. We're gonna breathe in through our nose and out through our mouth during the next minute. And we're just going to picture ourselves surrounded by things or people or pets that make us feel loved. And see their warmth surrounding you in a circle of strength and protection. And as you breathe in and out, see that circle of warmth, strength, and protection growing larger and larger. You might even start to picture some of the folks in your town or your, or your state or even our entire country and maybe the world. And as you keep breathing in and out, Feel that sense of connection with all of the other people on this webinar with you right now. Take a few more moments breathing in and out and slowly blink open your eyes and you can bring your hands back down and I'm gonna pass it back over to Martha. Thank you very much, Dana. We offer that um, more and more at the beginning of our webinars or events, um, partly because we all need it, right? Just to take a moment to stop and pause what we've been doing and let go of the busyness of the day. And also as a reminder and as an opportunity to teach you, um, if you haven't experienced moments of mindfulness, what a difference taking 30 seconds or 10 deep breaths can make in your body. So usually when we do this, people report that um, even if they've never done it before, that they're feeling instantly just a little bit better and a little bit more grounded and present. So we'll begin by thinking about what does mental health mean to youth? Or if you're not working with youth, what does it mean to you? The term mental health, and please feel free to answer in the chat. Great, youth, uh, mental health to youth means feeling good and being happy. Yeah, that's a great answer. Um, so if you have another answer, please feel free to write that down and we can go to the next slide while you all are writing that. Um, in our conversations with youth around New England, we've gotten a lot of different responses. If you really think about it, the term mental health, what does that mean? Is it well-being? Is it peace? Is it calm? Being at a happy place with yourself, fixing our feelings, as one fifth grader told Dana recently, um, 
I spoke to a fifth grader who said mental health is about keeping up with your feelings. Um, and many kids uh, are able to talk about mental health in ways that um, in previous generations, those of us probably can think back and, and think there's no way we'd be talking about mental health with our friends, but we're finding that youth more and more are able to talk about these things. So other um, answers, not feeling pressured and feeling free, um, feeling calm and relaxed, um, health, let's see, total wellness, how am I feeling in my brain, am I calm, am I hurting? Those are fantastic questions. Healthy conditioning of the brain that simulates physical, mental, and emotional well-being. These are great answers, all of you, because it can be kind of a tough question um, to answer. Peace and tranquility, absolutely. Um, but we know that mental health has really changed um, for all of us over the last year and a half, and particularly for kids who have had to um, deal with a lot of changes and a lot of transitions and isolation and um, being distanced from some of the social connections that they uh, kids have had in, in the past, even a year or ago. So how has COVID affected ki kids and teens' mental health? Well, before COVID, we knew that about 20% of all kids under 18 had a mental health challenge of some type. Um, and we know that suicide has been the third leading cause of death for teenagers um, after accidents and Sorry, I can't remember what the second one is, but um, you know, so we we have been long, we've been aware for a very long time that youth mental health has been something that um, we have needed to attend to. And yes, we will definitely share our PowerPoint, um, which you will get after the presentation, not a problem. But even though before COVID, 20% of youth said that they had um, experienced mental health challenges. We know now that 37 to 44% of youth are reporting mental health challenges. Um, and those kids who already had a mental health challenge, their lives have been made even more difficult. And the challenges that surround that mental health diagnosis or difficulty um, has become more challenging in a lot of ways. And one in four youth in America has considered suicide last summer. So the numbers are going up. We're facing a real crisis, a real public health crisis, tending to the mental health and well being of our kids. Um, and we know that that's going to continue into the near future. Um, in a recent poll of high school students, 50% said they were moderately, very, or extremely worried about their mental health. I mean, think about that. Half of kids are moderately to extremely worried. 62% reported stress, feeling stress. Half experienced anxiety. Uh, a third experienced significant depression. And one in four knew somebody who had considered suicide, in addition to those who um, had also thought about suicide themselves. So we know that the scope of the issue is, is wide and deep and that it disproportionately affects more some groups more than others. Um, so with that in mind, um, when we've been talking to youth about their mental health, uh, we've asked them how COVID-19 has affected remote learning um, or how remote learning and COVID-19 has affected youth mental health. And kids are reporting that it has often made them feel um, like they're falling behind in school um, like they are stressed and worried about um, getting back to normal and what that might be and whether they'll be prepared. Um, they feel that their future is uncertain and they're feeling often very lonely and isolated. Um, even as we are changing and things are opening and schools getting back into a rhythm. But we also asked them what's helped. And a lot of kids talked about all of the amazing, creative, imaginative ways that they have developed to help them cope with these types of stresses, including good old distraction, getting into a book, um, being involved in binge watching uh, TV series um, or YouTube channels or uh, learning more about a particular subject that they're interested in. Um, and that it is also, COVID-19 and remote learning has allowed them to spend more time with the people that they're closest to, um, which has been really good because there have been a lot of challenges. Um, a lot of kids are reporting having to cope with grief and loss. 
Um, but, you know, we also are very aware that home and being home is not a safe and happy place for many, many kids. Um, and that the feelings of isolation and missing out and not being able to participate in their regular activities or sports is a really profound loss for a lot of kids. Next slide. So I'll pass it to Dana to tell us a little bit more about how this relates to the idea of trauma. So we wanted to really differentiate between trauma and stress and how those things connect to mental well-being. So first I'll talk a little bit about trauma, um, which can lead to mental health challenges, uh, but not always. And the way we define trauma is that it's something that happens that is too much, too soon, or too fast for someone to process and integrate. And those are big words, process and integrate. Um, but what we mean is basically, it's something that you can't make sense of and you can't make a part of your story, your narrative easily. It takes some work to make sense of something that happened. And trauma often leads to this feeling of being out of control, which makes it difficult for us to care for our mental well being and to achieve that sense of calm and peace that a lot of you uh, put in the chat as being associated with mental health. So that's trauma. And I'm going to pass it back to Martha to talk about stress. Yeah, as Dana said, you know, the ideas of trauma and stress are certainly related but not necessarily, one doesn't necessarily always follow another. So what's the difference between trauma and stress when they're kind of used interchangeably often um, in, in, in the public domain and in public discussion? Stress is physical, mental, or emotional strain or tension in response to a perceived threat to stability or homeostasis, if you remember that, that word from high school bio. Um, how you feel when the demands on you exceed your resources. Stress can be acute or chronic, um, immediate or historical. It can be tied to trauma or to circumstances, personal or widespread. Certainly we've seen a lot of stress related to COVID-19, um, stress to perform, stress to balance it all. Um, but that doesn't necessarily mean that it's a trauma, although it can be. Traumatic experience are always stressful but stressors are not always traumatic. So there's the stress of being late for an appointment. That's not necessarily um, traumatic, but if you think of a, a particular trauma like um, adverse childhood experiences, those types of traumas always cause stress. Um, stress is not always harmful. There's good stress, good pressure to get something done or to, throw a party or something, that's also a type of stress, but it's not necessarily harmful. Trauma almost nearly, nearly always is. Did I say that right? You understand, you know what I mean. It's trauma is almost always um, harmful. And stress and trauma aren't the same for everyone. What's traumatic for one person may not be for another. And same with stress. Some people have a very, very high tolerance for both stress and trauma. Um, some people, it depends on the situation. Um, so it's important to keep in mind that stress and trauma are not one particular thing that fits for everybody. And that's especially important to remember when you're talking about kids and youth and their experiences. Next slide. So in terms of healing from trauma, there are lots of ways that you can begin to do that. Um, uh, the first way is to work with it, deal with it, process and integrate the trauma. That means accepting that this traumatic thing has happened, integrating it into your experience, working through it. Um, you can help your body and mind relax by starting to repair the central nervous system, all of those receptors and chemicals and brain processes that, that get alerted um, that Dana's going to talk about in a, in a moment you know, need to be calmed down and brought back to that homeostasis. Um, and the third way is by taking control and reclaiming agency and choice. And that is particularly important. Well, it's important for all of us, but particularly important for kids who often have limited ways of doing that. 
So the first thing that Martha mentioned was just dealing with the trauma. A lot of us, when we have something traumatic that happens, sometimes the way that the brain works is we kind of hide that memory in our brains and try not to think about it. But with traumatic experiences, if we do that, it's eventually going to come up in our lives in some ways. So um, it's most effective to confront that trauma head on when you have the capacity to do that. That might not mean right after a traumatic event, you might need some time away from thinking about that before you start to deal with it. But there are lots of different ways to integrate and process that trauma. Um, one really effective way is talking about it, sharing your story in a place that feels safe. That's an important part of that. Um, and some safe places might be in therapy with a professional who understands how to help you work through that situation. You might also have some friends or family members that are particularly supportive that could be in conversation with you. Um, there are also lots of great online support groups, which we'll talk about uh, some places to find those later. Another very effective way of helping yourself to process trauma is to write about your experience. And that could be for yourself, just in a journal. Um, you could also create pieces of fiction or nonfiction, maybe even a comic book, anything that you want to either keep for yourself or put out into the public to share your story so that other people experiencing similar situations feel like they have someone else that they uh, that, that relates to them. And then also doing something physical can be really helpful in processing trauma. Some folks like to draw or create other pieces of art. Dancing is also a very effective way to get your body moving to shake away some of that trauma, which we'll talk about in a second. Um, anything that you're doing, expressing your story in any way that makes sense to you can help you deal with your trauma. And we all have different ways of coping with stress and trauma. I mean, they're the ways that we learned early on as children. But it's also important to remember, especially when you're talking with kids about their own experiences of stress and trauma, that coping is based on a set of skills that can be learned and improved on. Um, we use unhealthy methods of coping before we've learned healthier methods of coping. So an example of healthy coping, addressing the source, as uh, Dana said, um, talking about it, fixing the problem if it's something that is within your control to fix, asking for help, exercise, distracting yourself, like some of those kids mentioned that we had spoken to about COVID-19, um, mindfulness and mindfulness-based stress reduction or CBT techniques. There are all sorts of therapeutic techniques that have been developed to help you process stress and trauma, um, looking for ways to connect with others um, or connect to yourself in a deeper way and accepting that some things are beyond your control, that this traumatic or stressful event happened, um, but that you can move forward in a healthy way. Um, but we also know that there are a lot of unhealthy ways of coping. Um, and these are also really important to think about in your own life um, and what you're modeling for the kids in your life, and also talking with kids about this really explicitly. Unhealthy coping can look like um, being abusive to somebody, not communicating, spending too much money, using substances um, to excess, being absent, just not coming to work, not going to school, being absent, um, or even, even present, presenteeism, so being somewhere but being kind of checked out, Ad adultifying children, so casting children in the roles that should be um, the responsibility of adults, denial, like this isn't happening, I feel fine, everything's okay, um, and anger, blame, and avoidance, and all of those coping methods, when you start to notice that those things are happening in excess and beyond your control, that's a sign that some problem or issue needs to be addressed. Next. So one way that we can help young people understand how to address their own trauma and toxic stress is to help them understand the way that the central nervous system works. 
So our central nervous system is um, our brain is a huge part of it, but it also goes with the brain stem. And there's this nerve called the vagus nerve that nerve that wraps around from the very bottom of the brain and goes all the way kind of in a spiral to touch on all of our major organs. And the job of that nerve is to help us reach that big term that Martha used earlier, homeostasis or stability, a balancing point. Our body loves to find balance, not too excited, not too calm, but right there in the middle. And so it's our central nervous system's job to do that. And if you look at this picture on the screen, you see these two dotted lines that represents the window of tolerance for our central nervous system. So the top line is kind of the excitement line and the bottom line is the calm line. And most people's bodies have the, this window of tolerance where, where our central nervous system is really good at dealing with stressors and coming back to that middle range, finding that stability. However, when we have a traumatic event happen, it changes the way our central nervous system responds to stressors. So you probably have heard of the fight, flight, or freeze syndrome. Well, that's what the central nervous system does. It turns that, that response on. So if you look at the red line here, this is the way that the central nervous system of someone who's experienced trauma reacts versus the gray line, which is a normal reaction to stress. So as you'll see, it might mean that we reach that excitement point a little bit higher, at, a little bit easier rather. And then when, instead of coming back to the middle, our body goes all the way back down to that more depressive stage. And we might also stay in a state of heightened anxiety for a longer period of time. And it's more difficult for our central nervous system to bring us back into a normal range. But luckily there are some really concrete ways that we can change the way our central nervous system works to get back in that normal range. I mentioned earlier how beneficial dancing is to process trauma. And that's in part because of the way that we can reset our central nervous system. Animals in the wild, they never feel like a stressful situation is traumatic because they are able to complete the stress response cycle. And the way that animals do it inherently without anyone needing to teach them is they literally shake it off. You might've seen this with a dog. When a dog gets stressed about something, he'll just shake really wildly and then move on with his day. Um, and we can do the same thing. So dancing is really effective, but there's also some great mindfulness techniques that help bring our body back into the, that normal range. And some of these techniques um, do that really effectively in the moment, but all of them will help us stay in that normal range and retrain our bodies to get to that stability point more easily, the more often we practice these things. Um, so I wanna practice a few of these with you right now. The first one is breath work. And this is kind of the SOS technique that we like to teach folks about because research shows that our breath is directly connected to our central nervous system. And if we slow down and start to breathe deeper and more slowly, that has an immediate effect on our heart rate, our sweating, and um, our mental sense of calm. So let's practice some breath work together. This is one I like to give to adults and youth because it's not too hokey, it's, it's very simple, and you can also do it without anyone knowing. It's called the F breathing SOS. And you just have to find a straight spine and look in front of you. You don't need to close your eyes. And then you're just gonna breathe in through your nose as you count up to four and out through your mouth as you count down from four. Then find a slight smile and continue to breathe in, counting up to four and down from four until you find that sense of calm. And if you're alone and you need a little extra prompt, you can also use your finger 
And you can add in some holding of the breath. So you can count as you breathe in through your nose, one, two, three, four, and hold it, one, two, three, four, and then out through your mouth, four, three, two, one, and hold the breath out, four, three, two, one. That second one is called square breathing. And if you're working with younger children, there are some great YouTube videos that have some fun visuals drawing the square as they breathe in and out. Another way to help reset our central nervous system is using meditation. And we did a very brief version of our heart beaming meditation at the beginning of class, but um, let's do another meditation right now. So again, find some spot on the floor so your feet can be flat and find that straight spine again. You're welcome to keep your eyes open or close them down and go ahead and breathe in and out. And start at the top of your head and notice if you're scrunching your forehead or clenching your jaw or if your tongue is on the roof of your mouth. Let go of all that tension Breathing in through the nose, out through the mouth. Where are your shoulders? Are they up near your ears? If so, let them relax down. Breathing in and out. If you're holding in your chest or your belly, release any tension and just let yourself breathe naturally in through your nose, out through your mouth. Take a few more breaths at your own pace. And slowly come back to the room, blinking open the eyes. And there I combined a little body scan with meditation, which can be really powerful to help students also just recognize where they're holding stress in their body. And then yoga and movement can be really powerful practices. And I will talk a little more at the end of this time together, but I would love to invite you to our next webinar on May 11th called Demystifying the Trauma-Informed Yoga Practice, because there are very specific types of yoga that have been developed to help people process their trauma. And we have another uh, webinar that's on our YouTube page and on the New England Mental Health Technology Transfer Center uh, website called Trauma-Informed Yoga in School that gives you some more information about that. There are really a lot of great places in the school day that we can integrate yoga. We could do it before or after school. We can also use it as a mindful moment to start the school day off together when we're coming back from recess to transition into learning time or lunch. We can also do it as classroom teachers or school mental health professionals when we notice that a student is triggered or um, that the whole class needs a little bit of a movement break, that's a great opportunity to pause the learning and do some yoga because yoga can actually improve focus and concentration. And it definitely contributes to a sense of calm. So you could also use it right before a presentation or a test. And there are some great chair yoga movements that we can do as adults, even when we don't have the time to roll out our mat and do a whole class, we could do something in our chairs. So where I'll give you a moment to get in a chair, a couch, anything that you want. And I'm just gonna make sure you can see me, yes. Um, so I'll do a little chair yoga with you. So take your hands and put them out in front of you and cross one hand over the other and then bend your elbows, bringing your, uh, the backs of your hands together. If you want, you can bring the palms of your hands, but either way. And then we're just gonna hug in, bring your elbows down to hug in. This stretches our back and our neck muscles. 
Then we're gonna straighten those elbows, straighten those arms and switch your hand so the other arm is on top. Then again, bring the backs of the hands together or you can bring the palms together. Then bring the elbows down, hugging it in towards your body for a little stretch of the back and the neck. And then untwist. And if you have a table in front of you, you can place your hands down on the table. And we're gonna, if not, you can just put them out in front of you. Um, and then we're gonna take one hand, raise it up and bring it behind you, grabbing the back of your chair and look over that shoulder for a little twist. Then come back to center and switch, bringing that other hand behind you, touching your chair and looking over your shoulder. And we'll come back to center and we'll just close by breathing in as we bring our hands up above and leaning back just a little and breathing out as we bring our hands forward. And if you like, you can bend down to rest your chest on your knees or you can bring your hands to your desk and let your head rest on your desk and then slowly rise up. There are great chair yoga classes on YouTube as well and plenty of wonderful free classes for youth of all ages. And you can even search for specific classes that will help raise the energy or calm students down. Um, so and reach out to us if you need any resources for that. Another way to use mindfulness to process trauma is to infuse mindful habits throughout your day, um, increasing your sense of compassion, your sense of gratitude, leaving more moments for reflection. And we have a short video about five mindful habits that helps give schools and families ideas for how to infuse those throughout the day. A very, very important aspect of taking care of yourself, whether or not you're experiencing a traumatic experience, is to rest and disconnect. We've been hearing the term burnout and compassion fatigue a lot these days. And really the most effective way of overcoming burnout and compassion fatigue is taking some time off completely, no schoolwork, no work, and disconnecting and being with yourself and others that you love, completely resting. And then um, <clears throat> making sure that we're thinking of holistic care for our body, getting exercise, eating healthy whole foods, and um, making sure that you have support systems outside of your work or school as well. And there are some more tips specifically for youth that are linked on this slide. So when you do get this slideshow, please do check out these other articles that give specific youth self-care tips. And now I'm gonna pass it over to Martha to talk about agency. I, I just wanted to, before we talk about agency, bring up the point that Cora mentioned in the chat about adaptive yoga and um, yoga for kids or, adults, anybody, seniors who um, might have a physical disability or an illness or a chronic illness, there are many yoga teachers who specialize in those kinds of adaptive practices um, that are, uh, that you can find online. But, you know, it's important as with any sort of practice or physical practice um, to just make sure that that's done by somebody who is educated and safe and that it's in line with um, your child's or your own needs and abilities and medical situation. But um, as somebody who had a, a very serious spinal injury as a kid, um, I broke my back. Yoga was really, really helpful for me in processing that trauma and learning how to get control of my body again. So I can tell you from personal experience that even if it's not all bendy and you're not upside down, there are some many wonderful parts of yoga that can be very helpful um, both for the, the body and the mind. Um, and that brings us to the, the next part of the discussion, which is about agency. And 
really we, we talk about the the term agency and many of you may know what that means it's the ability and the sense that you can influence your own thinking and experience so it's that sense of control your ability to make choices your confidence that you can change your body or your life um, what trauma and stress does is make that feeling of your own agency disappear if you think about an experience that is stressful or traumatic what you are really thinking about is when things were out of control when you didn't have control over your own body or your own experience when you didn't know if you would be able to protect yourself you didn't know um, from either a profound trauma to a stressor like i'm stuck in traffic i can't get to that appointment every it's out of control i can't i can't get there there's nothing i can do so we talk about the sense of agency in the context of the practices that Dana walked us through, because all of those practices are about reestablishing that sense of control of your own body, your own mind. And those practices are the types of practices that kids can learn to help them regain a sense of control and regain a sense of agency. That breath work is about being in the moment, so not being focused on what happened before or after, um, not being afraid or anxious. Um, and it's about giving yourself, giving your child an opportunity to learn that they're in control of their experience in their body. And that's why we focus on those. And that's why Dana does um, those wonderful walkthroughs of those practices. And we have so many of those available if you're interested in learning more. Um, through the CTLC website and our base camp resources. But if trauma can make you feel like you've lost control of your body and life, reintroducing healthy strategies to regain control can help you or a youth promote resilience, help um, you or, or kids feel like they're able to make changes in their lives, take control of their lives and experiences. But when you're a kid, you by definition and have some limits in um, what type, type of control you have over your body and your experience. You have to eat dinner when, when somebody makes dinner for you. You have to go to school at a certain time. You have to complete your homework. You have to, you know, you're, you're little. So if you think about the ways that if um, you've ever worked with toddlers or had toddlers, how they say, no, I do it that is your toddler establishing control and learning how to have some agency um but agency and making choices can be overwhelming i mean many of us want to regain agency but we don't know how particularly when we're feeling stressed or in the middle of a trauma um you know many of us especially including youth as i just mentioned have to live by other people's rules or goals um youth particularly have a, a very fierce and very important need for privacy um, so they they want to keep things hidden especially as they get into teen years um, and begin differentiating and getting ready to go out into the world um, and kids are developing a sense of identity i mean we all are really <laughs> um, particularly at different stages of our lives but when you are a child um, moving towards adulthood, you're developing your sense of yourself. So you can learn your, see yourself as somebody who doesn't have control over their bodies and their experiences, or you can see yourself as somebody who has some agency. So those are the types of feelings, that, that sense of agency that we want to cultivate for kids. Um, but it's important for kids to find the supportive people who believe in them and listen. Um, it's important to think about changing the triggers that you can, um, getting out of situations that feel triggering if you can, um, understanding yourself. As adults, we know this, and some of us have learned to do this sort of intuitively. Others of us have had to learn this as adults, where you learn, oh, being in that kind of situation um, makes me feel really bad about myself, and I don't want to do that anymore. So. I know that that is not a situation I want to go into, right? And as adults, we can just leave. Kids have a little bit more difficulty um, being able to leave. Um, identifying your strengths and interests. We talk a lot about trauma and the challenges and lack of agency, but equally important is identifying your strengths. 
identifying what you're interested in, cultivating your own sense of identity, growing the strong parts, um, and all of us have them, to be larger and to take center stage in our lives and experiences. Finding small ways to practice making decisions and taking action, like the practices that Dana went through, planning for the future, seeing a future for yourself, and advocating and speaking up when you can. And part of that advocating and speaking up when they can is youth understanding how to advocate for their own mental health. So we gave you a presentation to help um, you understand the difference between trauma and stress and how that affects mental well being. And we hope that we delivered it in a way that uses language that youth can understand. Um, even what I presented around the central nervous system. I have taught that to middle schoolers before and they have understood. Um, and it's very empowering for youth to understand the way their brains and bodies react to trauma and stress and how they can use mindfulness and other tools to process that trauma or mental health challenge. And then giving them stories of how other youth have successfully advocated for systemic changes to support their mental well-being can be powerful and inspire them to do the same in their own communities. And these are just a few examples of that. Um, there was a group of high schoolers in Oregon that successfully lobbied their state legislators to include mental health days as excused absences, and that is now a law. Um, there is also a group of teens in Pennsylvania who worked together to convince policymakers at, and their state legislator to include mental health education in curricula for all schools across the state. And then the survivors of the Parkland high school shooting have really started a nationwide conversation about how gun violence affects mental health, not just um, as in terms of how school shooters may or may not have mental health challenges that are unaddressed, but how being a survivor of a school shooting leads to lifelong mental health consequences, not just for those who were present in the school, but everyone in the school community. And they've also expanded that to just youth in general, see all of these school shootings on the news and living in a culture that accepts that has affected their mental health as well. Um, each of these stories are linked when you receive this slideshow. And then there's also a, an article there that has a few different young people who are mental health activists that can follow their work as individuals. So how do youth advocate for their mental health? Um, we're gonna elaborate on these points in a tip sheet that we'll share out with you um, in the post, uh, the post webinar follow-up email. Uh, but one thing is for youth to figure out who they want to talk with. There are lots of different options here. They might wanna start at their school building and talk to principals, vice principals and other administrators about changes that could happen within their school. They might also want to talk with leaders at the state or regional or even national le level about systemic changes that they could make to the way that school is done and the way that mental health is addressed in school. Once youth do figure out who they are meeting with, it's important to get to know them, understand what positions they have already on mental health. Uh, have they written any articles or tried to uh, pass any bills themselves or have they produced anything that gives you an idea of what they think about mental health um, or what do they care about? Are, is this a policymaker who is much more concerned with money than anything else? Then you might want to present some facts related to how uh, doing universal mental health care at the school level can actually save states and our country money over the long term. Um, but when you present facts, it's also important to present your story, sharing how you personally have been affected by the policies, procedures, and practices around mental health and education. Um, when, you, when youth do meet with leaders, 
it's important to have a very clear ask. What do you want them to do? Do you like the teens in Oregon? Do you want mental health days as an excused absence? Like the teens in Pennsylvania, do you want mental health education in the curricula? Or is it something else? Whenever you complete your presentation, make sure that you walk away with those leaders understanding what they need to do to make things better. And then if you don't hear from the folks that you're meeting with, follow up, send an email, show up at their office again, give them a phone call, uh, don't give up. Leaders are often really busy and it's not that they don't care. They might just have gotten something else put on their agenda and they forgot to follow through. So do be, be tenacious and keep at it. And youth can uh, do this as an individual, but there's a lot more power in numbers and there already are a few, quite a few youth led my advocacy organizations that focus on mental health. So here are a few, all of them are linked in the presentation. We've got Young Minds Advocacy. The group in Pennsylvania um, is actually the Jewish Heritage Foundation Youth Advocacy Network, but they do work with non-Jewish folks as well. The National Alliance for Mental Illness, NAMI, they have a lot of teen and young adult programming. So earlier we talked about support groups. You can find online uh, NAMI support groups by state by going to their website. And then there's actually a global coalition on youth mental health that's working to change the way that adults address youth mental health all around the world. I'll pass it over to Martha again. Thank you very much, Dana. As I mentioned in the beginning, we developed this presentation for youth to speak with youth about their own experience of mental health and well being. And you'll recall to the beginning of this, we asked you to come up with some ideas of what mental health means, which you did in the chat, some really, really great answers. Um, and when we're talking about supporting youth, and supporting youth mental health and well-being, it begins with beginning to talk about what mental health is. That's the first step in being able to advocate, being able to reclaim agency, being able to recover from trauma and stress and build resilience. Um, and there are a lot of really important takeaway points um, that we want you to, to leave with and that we would love for you to communicate to the youth in your life. Um, uh, and I will answer Alice's question just as soon as I'm done with this about um, mental health first aid. But um, throughout the presentation, we walked you through thinking about, talking about what mental health is, some information about the neurobiology of stress and trauma, the difference between the two, some concrete um, ideas about how to engage in mindfulness practices, talking about advocacy and using your voice and story, those are all steps to help youth, to help anyone recover from the experience of trauma. And an important message for everyone is that you're not alone. If you've experienced something traumatic, if you're having a difficult time with something traumatic, coping with stress, you're not alone. There are many, many other people who are also dealing with similar types of struggles. Um, and it's important to reach out to somebody that you trust and to establish connections between youth and trusted, compassionate, educated adults. Recovery from trauma is possible. It's not only possible, it's something that you, that youth can look forward to and get support to work towards. But you are your own expert on how that happens and how that needs to happen. Um, it's a recovery from trauma is a skill that you can learn. We talked about some of those skills and I don't know how many of you were sitting there thinking, gosh, if only I'd learned that when I was 11 or 16 or 22, um, how much easier it would have been to recover. But that's something that we wanna to transmit to kids, show them how to use these skills. Taking care of yourself and treating yourself with compassion is the beginning step. It's how we begin to model these things for the youth in our lives. It's how we begin to take care of ourselves is by treating ourselves with love and compassion, talking to ourselves the way that we would talk to any other person that we love and care for. Finding ways to increase agency and, and facilitate choice. Um, like the example of the kids in Oregon being able to choose to have mental health days 
just like many of us who say, oh, I need a mental health day. Having those types of opportunities to practice agency is really important. Advocacy is a powerful way to transform your stories. And humans have always known this. And we have done that from the beginning of time by engaging in storytelling. Um, and then later adding data and other types of more formal advocacy, but storytelling is advocacy. Um, transforming your experiences into strength, sharing your experience, strength and hope with other people who've had similar experiences. Um, and the last piece is that youth have a powerful and important voice in this work. In fact, they're the center of, of this work that we're talking about today and how we talk to them about trauma, how we address the trauma, how we cultivate resilience needs to also be done in partnership with them and their voice and their needs because they are able to share with us things that we couldn't even imagine, right? And ask and teach us things um, that we can do to help support them and to foster resilience so that they can move into adulthood with um, some really important skills to, uh, facilitate their own mental health and well-being. So I'm going to pass it back to Dana to talk about some of the ways that we are looking to engage youth voice in our work. Yes, thanks, Martha. So we are a part of the healthcare workers and educators addressing and reducing trauma collective. That's the heart collective. Um, SAMHSA and HRSA region one offices uh, are working together with New England MHTTC to help educators and healthcare workers work uh, in make their collaborations more effective around school mental health. And we're looking for opinions from youth on what we should be doing because they often have innovative ideas that we wouldn't have thought of. So again, when you get our slideshow, there will be a link to the application. And I believe our wonderful webinar manager is also just put that in the chat. Uh, there's a flyer that you can share with youth that has all of this information on the screen there. And it also has a link to our application. So please do share this with any youth in New England. They get a letter of recommendation from our region one uh, regional assistant regional administrator, Taylor Bryan Turner, and they can earn some community service hours. They are whatever opinions they bring to us will directly be shared with leaders in behavior and mental health as well as educators throughout the New England region and they'll actually get to be in rooms with these folks and they'll we'll also provide some of the practices and tips that we talked about today during those sessions so that they'll have leave with tools to improve their mental health as well. Um, at the moment, we have two opening sessions, May 20th and 27th at 4 p.m. So please do share this opportunity with any youth who you think would be a good fit for our student advisory board. We also wanna invite you to our upcoming events on May 11th. I mentioned that we have a webinar, a listening session actually, about demystifying the trauma-informed yoga practice with Exhale to Inhale lead trainer, Julie Fernandez. We also have a webinar about self-care strategies with myself on June 16th. And that small little section where we talked about breath work and mindfulness and yoga, I'll be expanding that and talking more about those habits and strategies to infuse wellness into every aspect of your life. So come back for that. Um, we also have a family compassionate conversation series. This is an opportunity for anyone who identifies as a family member of a pre-K to 12 student um, who is experiencing mental health challenges. Uh, they can come to these sessions and we do a brief mindfulness practice. Then we share tips on that month's topic. And then we have an open conversation where family members get to share their successes on that month's topic 
their challenges, and also ask questions. Our next conversation is Wednesday, May 26th, and this is actually a Spanish language conversation, and the topic is wellness for Latinx families. And then we'll have another each month um, in June, we'll talk about addressing school-related trauma. In July, we'll talk about holistic health. And then in August, we'll close our series with a community wellness event. And at the national level, the, the MHTTC network is doing an eight part series about the national school mental health best practices, implementation guidance mod modules for states, districts, and schools. And on May 11th at 1 p.m. Eastern, we're going to be doing module seven, which is about funding and sustainability for school mental health systems. So join us then uh, for more information about that. And to close out, we just want to remind you that our funding does come from the Substance Abuse and Mental Health Services Administration, which requires us to evaluate our services. It's a very brief survey. You'll see the link there. Um, also, there's a scan that you can use your phone there. Uh, so please do take that survey. It helps us retain our funding and provide more services that you all want. And attendees providing their email address will receive this evaluation survey as well as the slide presentation and a link to our archive and the tip sheet that I mentioned. Um, if you would like a certificate of attendance, that's also going to be included there. If you would like to contact Martha or myself, our email addresses are right there. And we really do appreciate you being with us today. Have a wonderful day and we hope to see you again soon. Thank you everyone for being with us. Take care of yourselves and each other and let us know if you have any questions. Thank you for being here. Thank you.